Hello and welcome to this very important third episode of the Global Growth Strategist podcast series. My name is Simon Haig and I'm delighted once again to be joined as both my co-host and my special guest for this very special episode, Henry Wang. Henry, how are you? Hi, Simon. Very nice to see you again. And, and you. Uh, well, overcoming COVID has really incurred unprecedented human and economic costs globally. Unlike other economic crises, this health pandemic is really causing serious damages, economic damages, as well as disruption to people's lives and supply chain globally. Experts globally that we're working with have warned that this isn't a temporary hiccup but a warning of more serious things to come. There are some countries which are pushing for fast recovery and return to business as usual with some quick fixes. However, there are also countries and leaders with longer visions pushing to build back better with sustainable improvements. A good example is the recent call by United Nations World Economic Forum and the G20 and B20 on building back better post-COVID with international collaborations. Thank, thanks, Henry. And, you know, uh, when I was younger, um, I remember reading a book by, uh, by the leader of the Green Party in the UK called uh, Jonathan Porritt, and he warned of a crisis ahead, and that was in sort of the late 80s. And so it's a real privilege to be talking to you about this extremely important issue. I understand something like 20% of, of the world's ecosystem or animals are uh, close to extinction as a result of you know, actions of humankind. So this climate crisis and everything around it is critically important. So, but geopolitically, this crisis, this current COVID crisis has from a medical research perspective at least, underlined the huge value of global collaboration. We are definitely witnessing the development and adaptation of life-saving technologies and massive research into various treatments. We're experiencing perhaps not seen before, certainly not since the 1980s AIDS crisis, sharing of scientific journals, genome sequencing data, clinical trials, bringing together thousands of scientists, medics, companies and researchers globally. To facilitate greater international collaboration and understanding, Henry and I are conducting a series of global podcasts with distinguished thought leaders from both the East and the West. And this is getting quite a bit of attention already. We were hoping to release, start releasing these podcasts in a, in a, in a couple of weeks through all the various channels. Um, these thought leaders will be discussing key topical issues, including healthcare, youth, innovation, media, leadership, culture, and of course, uh, I'm delighted to be talking about climate change with Henry. We hope that these open exchanges of views with international thought leaders from both the East and the West should help foster greater international understanding and cooperation. We're delighted that all episodes will be featured on all leading podcast channels, YouTube, social media, and much more. So without further ado, Henry, um, it's wonderful that uh, you've been invited to join various climate boards globally uh, and you obviously own your own company. Can you give us an overview of your distinguished career? Well, thank you, Simon. I've been lucky to be involved in climate change many years ago when I was director of a multinational uh, energy company and I was uh, working in Beijing at that time. And I was asked to prepare the strategy, climate change strategy and our clean energy strategies at that time. And I was also lucky to be invited by the Prime Minister of, of the UK and the Prime Minister of China to join their bilateral working group on climate change and green energy at that time. And these really allowed me to realize how important climate change is uh, for all of us and how important it is for the whole world and as you said you know the climate change have caused significant biodiversity damage 
And if it continues, it could have Im caused enormous damage to our GDP and our way of life globally. So it's important that we work together to, with international cooperation to solve these problems. Uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, well done. I understand you've been invited to join the G20, B20, uh, International Climate, Sustainability and Energy Task Force. Um, maybe just give us a, a flavor of your key activities and aims in that task force. Thank you. Well, this is a very honor to be invited to work with uh, experts and CEOs globally on preparing the new policy papers for the G20 Global Leader Meeting that is currently planned to be held in November. And uh, we've been working together with the global experts in the last 10 months and also uh, in different teams uh, chaired by leaders, global business leaders and global leaders. And in my area, which is on climate change, sustainability and energy, we have for some very senior people, for example, the CEO of Sinopank Reliance Total, and other companies, other leading national companies and international companies working together with us, with experts like myself and others working in the very important areas of climate change, global warming, carbon emissions. And we are in the process of finalizing our recommendations and policy papers to the G20 leaders. And I'm glad that we have actually working together with experts and CEOs and others across different countries. We are all able to come to agree that climate change is a very important area. And we should work together with international collaboration on the very important areas such as reducing climate change, reducing carbon emissions, accelerating energy transition, promoting the use of clean energy, reducing the use of fossil fuel, reducing pollution and improving ocean and the blue economy. These are all very important areas which we hoped to present in our policy paper to the G20 leaders in their summit in November. Wow, and I don't think there's a more important issue for planet Earth, so congratulations on your appointment. So how, how do you see different regions globally seizing the initiative for climate change? Yeah, it is uh, at this moment from working with all the international leaders and also business leaders, it is actually interesting for me to see that in different regions, there are different attitudes towards climate change. And, and some regions strongly support climate change. And you've seen the announcement, for example, by UK Prime Minister of carbon neutrality by 2050, and also the recent announcement by President Xi Jinping in his UN speech of China achieving carbon neutrality by 2060. These are very encouraging. And of course, there's a lot of work to be done before to, that these important targets can be achieved. But there are also other countries which are less, or regions which are less supportive of these. And that's why international sharing collaborations are very, very important because this is a global problem and we got to work together together to re reduce carbon emission, to reduce global warming for everybody on this earth. Absolutely. As you said, all, there isn't one of the seven and a half billion of us who isn't unaffected by this. So you, you mentioned international collaboration. How important really is international collaboration for climate change? Well, international collaboration is very important. I mean, take the B20 task force that I'm working on. 
I mean, that is we are currently involving uh, a lot of different countries in the task force and we all work very well together, sharing common views and discussions. And also in the bilateral working group that I've been lucky, climate change working group that I've been involved, there are some ongoing collaborations. I can mention, share with you a few impressed important ones that are going on, for example, between the UK and China. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, good collaboration between UK and China on smart city development. Smart city is also is very important because this is improving the future design of the cities that we all live in. Uh, as global migrations and urban migrations improve, most of increasing amount percentage of the population in the world will be living in global cities and therefore improving this city making them greener making them more using more renewable energy uh, at the same time reducing waste and also uh, improving city farming and improving transportation making it more green transportation with less carbon emissions will contribute significantly to minimizing climate change and reducing carbon emissions. So this is the important areas. And I'm glad that there has been good cooperations and exchange I've been involved in, and that's been going on between the UK, China, Singapore, and China, and other areas. And this is very encouraging. Uh, another very important area is really in the area of green finance, because looking ahead, uh, there's been, there needs to be significant uh, investments on uh, renewables and green areas. And in fact, uh, looking back on the last 10 years, this has been tremendous growth of green investments. Uh, and uh, the International Renewable Association is saying that looking ahead, you know, 20, 200 billion of investment per year likely to be spent to, on promoting renewable energy uh, in the foreseeable future. So this is very important that we have the right systems and governance systems in this area. And in this area, uh, the former Bank of England uh, Governor Mark Kenny and now the advisor, financial advisor to, to the UK Prime Minister for COP and also the UN Special Representative on Climate Change and Finance have been working a lot with different countries in the world on promoting important areas, improvements like ESG, which is environmental social governance you know, making all the banks and investment houses to adopt, to make sure that the investment plans and everything fits the environmental, social and governance standards. And they are now even moving forward. And last night I was invited to, to a meeting with, a, a virtual meeting with Mark Annie and the other financial leaders on science-based financial targets for the financial industry and investment bank where many investment banks are supporting this uh, improvements. And these will help to drive investments to greener standards, to adhere to, to pay more attention to environmental social governance standards. And uh, this is good. I mean, this is also uh, making sure that that the investments are going into the right areas, into green energy, and also uh, less into coal and fossil areas. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, the whole area of education as well. I, I was fortunate enough to, 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 to be a guest and, and come to one of your lectures at Imperial College last, I think it was last year, or was it the year before? Yeah, last, year. last yeah. year, yes. And uh, you were talking about... Uh, uh, green finance to a, a group of very, very intelligent students. So how important is climate change education? I agree with you, uh, Simon. 
that it is very, very important. And I, I was very glad that uh, you were able to join me in, in my annual lecture to the Imperial College Business School postgraduate students in climate finance. And these are some of the best and brightest students uh, in the UK and in the world, really. Mm. And the important thing is also they are passionate about climate change and, and improving the world. And uh, this is, let me share with you the real story. I mean, this year I was invited back, lucky to be invited back in January, uh, just before COVID really, to lecture to the students again. And I was able to discuss with them the, you know, the, the global outlook, the need for action on climate change. And, and they're really enthusiastic about this. And they've been really working through COVID on their studies and projects. And I was invited back on their sort of graduation presentation on the various climate change projects that they have been working on together, not only Imperial, but also together with Cambridge and other leading universities. So these are really some of the best and brightest students in the world. And some of these ideas they came in came through uh, are really game changers. And I mean, I and other people who was invited, including very senior investment bankers, fund managers, and CEOs were very impressed with the idea. Mm -hmm. Let me share with you a few ideas. I mean, global uh, plastic waste is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And they have come up with some, one team has come up with some wonderful ideas of establishing a global plastic credit uh, system where company can, uh, can, can earn credits for reducing plastic waste. And this gives real incentive for uh, companies now to reduce plastic waste and to improve their sustainability. Mm. And then there's another group uh, uh, of students who uh, come up with new ways of constructing building with sustainable timber. This contributes to the reforestation efforts and then reducing uh, cement, which is very polluting uh, industry. Yeah, these are really wonderful ideas by young people. And therefore, I think the education is, is very important. And, and when I see also now education uh, spreading not only to the youth, but also to all generations, I mean, in the UK, it is really interesting to see the mass environmental actions, you know, through education and uh, uh, that, that, that people are starting not only the youth, but the young people, the, the, the working people, plus also older people like, like myself are starting to realize how important it is. And they are generating actions demanding actions onto politicians and others which are resulting in the accelerated the climate change plans and, and new policies being announced by by politicians these are all very encouraging areas absolutely absolutely and and you're right it's funny my daughters if i leave a tap on too long they'll tell me to turn it off and um you know, we Absolutely. lived in we lived in Australia for ten years, and and for whatever reason, ego really, we had three cars as a family. We didn't yeah. need three cars, whereas today we live in Ireland, and my wife and I share one car. We only need one car. So, yeah. if everybody just thinks a little bit more about what they're doing, I think the world will really benefit. So, and so you've mentioned the youth. How important is youth and community support for climate change? That's a very, very important area. And uh, uh, I was lucky recently to be invited by, by the Hong Kong government to talk, you know, to give a speech in a green uh, climate change uh, conference. And, and the, this, the sustainability director of a local international school gave a really impressive speech speech about the things that she's working with her students 
first primary school and secondary school children. I mean, these are children from age of six up to about uh, 18 in their school. I mean, they have uh, installed renewable panels in their school. Uh, but more importantly, they have also installed traffic lights in their classroom. So the students are actually seeing whether they are using renewable energy or they are actually importing electricity from the grid, which relies on fossil fuel. So the, like, the students are learning to turn off lights or minimize uh, their electricity use so as to maximize renewable usage. Well, another wonderful thing the, 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 they show us was on food waste. I mean, food waste is a huge, huge problem. I mean, you can see that in all restaurants and canteens or whatever. But in this school, what they have done is to teach the students the importance of minimizing food waste. And they are also involving the, the children in recycling the food after they finish the food. They have their, now installed their own a digester where they, the student will collect the waste food and then put it into the digester. And the digester will make compost, which they can use in organic compost for the, stu for the uh, school gardens to grow their own organic plants and vegetables. I mean, that is a wonderful way to bring up students and youth because they can start learning the importance of climate change, renewable, you know, and build it into their lifestyle as they grown up into adults. And then when they have families, they can start sharing these very good habits with their family. And then when they're grandparents, they can share it with their future grandchildren. I think this is really a wonderful, sustainable way of uh, teaching and involving the, the youth and the younger people. And like you say, some of these younger people and youth go home and they are now, you know, passionate about passionate. minimizing waste and climate change and telling their parents and grandparents to change their habits, people like us. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I mean, the light behind me is off because my daughter told me to turn it off. She said, there's plenty of light outside. And, and you're right. I grew up in the 70s and um, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned about food waste and my parents were very strict and they said, I have whenever I had a meal, I had to make sure I ate everything and put the knife and fork straight uh, ahead on the plate. Today, I go to, you know, when you go to restaurants and particularly in parts of the Western world and you see so much food left on a plate, it's just criminal. I actually think it's criminal to see wasted food. But anyway, Absolutely. that's a personal bugbear. Um, and also you mentioned these initiatives. I, I read recently about an initiative in Korea, South Korea, whereby um, all... And I think in a certain district, all food waste was treated in a way that the, the water was extracted and just that the, the, um, the dry result, the product was uh, composted. So nothing was wasted. And it's amazing how much water comes out of food waste. So there's so many things that can be re-engineered in our thinking. So, so that's wonderful. So what would you say would be the top two to three priorities for climate change-led changes going forward? And, and why? why? What would be the top two or three and why? Well, that's a very important question. And, and I think international collaboration and sharing would, must be in one of those uh, top two to three priorities internationally. There has been a lot of international collaborations and we are in this together. And for example, let me give you an example. The, 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 the important area now, in, there's tremendous drive. I think a lot of countries are pushing ahead of energy transition to transition from fossil fuel into clean energy. And, you know, the, the advances that are being made in renewable areas is really tremendous. Mm. The international renewable uh, association has really published uh, the history of innovations that's been undertaken in different countries that you know change renewable energy from 10 years ago being a very very expensive form of energy not competitive against fossil fuel but now it is already more competitive for example 
in UK and in Europe, onshore wind and offshore wind are more competitive than fossil fuel and nuclear energy. I mean, this is tremendous area. And the we and looking ahead, they forecast in another five years maybe renewable all form of renewable energy including solar and other areas will be more competitive and more cost effective than fossil electricity generation i mean then you know it really gives good justification and uh, for the promotion and the use wider use of renewable and a lot of this have been achieved by sharing research in different countries and areas. And very, very excitingly now in renewable energy is the work on the energy storage system. So when the wind is not blowing or the sun is not shining, you can store your wind energy and your uh, solar energy in special new form of uh, energy storage system using air or nitrogen or water uh, where you can uh, then use this when the wind is not blowing or when the sun is not sh shining so that to give you uh, renewable supply of renewable clean energy 24 hours a day and these are tremendous things and and we should be sharing this absolutely and Henry, I have to say, I, I can feel the passion in your voice when you talk about climate change. I, I've, no, I've not actually spoken to you this long about this subject. And you have such passion and such knowledge. And it's just, it's, it's absorbing to listen. So how, I suppose the final question is, how can various climate change organizations in the East and the West collaborate better globally, do you think? Yeah. I think that's very important. I think there are many, many climate change organizations growing and mushrooming around the world. And, and that, that's fantastic. And they are all using their own ideas, originalities. And I'm involved in more or less every day of the week on Zoom meetings and virtual meetings. And that's fantastic. I mean, you know, let me give you some good examples of how East and West are working together. I mean, there, there is, the ocean is a very important area and the blue economy or drives that are being worked on by nations across the world, not only in the Pacific, but also in the Atlantic and in the East and the West on improving our oceans globally are fantastic. I mean, the ocean is so important. It's been a huge sink. Without sink for our CO2, without the ocean, our CO2 emissions and our global warming will be very, very much worse than what it is. Mm -hmm. But it has its side effects. I mean, the absorption of CO2 has made the water more acidic. And it has damaged the coral life, it's affecting the, the biodiversities. So we got to look after our, our, our oceans as well. So by organizations, oceanographic organization, many, many good oceanographic organizations in the East, in the West, working together to improve our oceans globally. That's been a tremendous area. And then the other area is really in a lot of good work are done at universities and education and in the really in the important areas of education that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many good uh, climate institutes. I'm personally invited to, to sit on the committee of the Grantham Institute of the Imperial College, which is one of the leading ones around the world, but there are many, many ones. And, we should work together in these many different areas to share knowledge and ideas. And that's very important. And, and very importantly also, I think working together on lobbying the governments and our politicians, East and West, in these very important areas, based on facts, based on science, and not based on you know, emotions and things like that. Mm. is really important 
to turn people's attitudes and to realize how important it is. I mean, really, on the G20, B20, we have looked at this very objectively. And in our policy papers and things like that to the global leaders, we, we are using fact-based, science-based arguments to say that, you know, if you look ahead, the world, the, the climate change at the moment, you know, temperature are rising, everybody knows it. And if you don't do much about it, the temperature are likely to rise by about three to four degrees by the end of the century. And what, what does it mean? I mean, you talk, tell the people it's going to be three to four. Okay, so the obvious things are, it's going to be hotter, there are going to be stronger hurricanes. You can see that there are more typhoons, there's more flooding, there's going to be more wood fire, forest fire. We heard all about this. But if you express that in global GDP terms, I mean, this is going to be a hit of about 30 to 40 percent on the global GDP. And this is obviously going to be disastrous. I mean, what we are having with COVID is already, you know, damage to the, to the, that's why the experts are saying this is not a temporary hiccup. This is a really a warning or a fast forward to what's going to likely to happen to the end of the century if we do nothing about climate change. So it is important that we work together on solving these very important problems, not only for our own good, but for the good of our future children and our grandchildren. Absolutely, Henry. And you know, as we said at the start, as you said at the start, you know, this current COVID crisis is a is a is really, um, it's, it's not just a temporary hiccup, it's a wake, serious wake-up call for something much, much worse if, if world leaders don't listen to thought leaders like you on this massively, massively important subject. So it was a delight and privilege to talk to you and, um, and uh, you know, keep up the amazing work, Henry. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I really enjoy our, our wonderful chat on this very important and meaningful topic and I hope that our, uh, our many listeners in different countries around the world will also find it useful and we can work together on this very important topic to minimize climate change and global warming globally. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. And you're right. Th th this is a groundbreaking podcast series you and I passionately decided to bring, bring together and um, Without naming names at this point, we have some very, very, very important people lined up for future podcasts. And um, um, this is not about you and I, Henry. This is about allowing these global thought leaders from the West and the East to share their wisdom and to facilitate just a little bit more collaboration. So thank you very much. And we hope you, the viewers and the listeners, uh, tune in for further installments. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.